In this video, we're going to talk about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. The first step is to separate the time and space variables, and then solve the time equation, define the notion of stationary states, and then write down the full time-dependent solution. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Dirac bracket notation, which allows us to use a shorthand that we'll use for the rest of the uh, course. So, uh, the Schrodinger equation has both spatial and time dependence. In fact, if you remember, uh, the Schrodinger equation looks like this. IH bar partial with, of psi with respect to t is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m partial squared psi with respect to x squared plus v of x and t psi. Where it can, this is capital psi, so it's a time dependent solution. Now, if the potential here is not a function of x and t, but it's only a potential of a, a function of x, then it's possible to solve for psi of x and t by separation of variables. Well, what we do for that is we assume that psi of x and t is a product of the of two functions, one which is only dependent on space and the other one which is only dependent on time. So psi of x times 5t. The time dependence of the full wave function is then just psi times d phi dt. And the spatial second derivative is also simplified because this has no spatial dependence. And so it's just the second derivative, full derivative of psi with respect to x squared. If I put these back into the Schrodinger equation, I get the following. Uh, I h bar psi d phi dt is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi dx squared phi plus v times psi phi. Now we haven't quite separated the variables. We have to get rid of all the spatial dependence here and the time dependence here. And we can do that by dividing by psi phi. So we do that, divide all everything by, by psi times phi. And now you see the spatial dependence cancels out here and we're only left with time dependence. And the time dependence cancels out of these two and we're only left with spatial dependence. So the final equation then that's separated is ih bar one over phi d phi dt plus minus h bar squared over 2m equals minus h bar squared over 2m times one over psi d squared psi dx squared plus the potential v. Now this has a solution only if, because all the time dependence is here, all the spatial dependence here, this only has a solution if they're both equal to a constant e. We're going to call that constant e. This is actually turns out to be the total energy, but it's really just a separation constant. So we'll now go ahead and we'll solve each of the two ordinary differential equations that are each equal to the same constant and then put the solution completely together. Well, uh, we're going to solve the time dependent portion first because the spatial portion will depend on the details of the potential energy v of x. That's where all the physics lies is where the potential is. So we have i h bar 1 over phi d phi dt is equal to e and we can rewrite that as d phi over phi and then equals minus i e over h bar dt. So we multiply times uh, dt and we divide it by i h bar. We bring the i up on top and I get a minus i. The solution is clearly uh, sim relatively simple. You can directly integrate this. If you integrate d phi over phi, you get log of phi. If you integrate uh, minus i e over h bar dt, you get minus i e t over h bar plus an integration constant c. If I take the antilog of both sides, I get that phi is equal to e to the minus i e t over h bar plus c. That c is in the exponent, so I can rewrite this as the product of two exponentials, the e to the minus i e t over h bar times e to the c power, but this is just a constant which we'll call a. So this then means that phi of t is equal to a e to the minus i e t over h bar. But it's this is a normalization constant, but I don't want to normalize it right yet because this is not the full solution. It's just the time dependent part. So I'm going to 
throw away this constant, set it equal to 1, and fold it into the normalization constant for the spatial solution. And so I can rewrite this then as my solution for the time-dependent portion, phi of t, is equal to e to the minus i e t over h bar. Now the total wave function then depends on time in this very particular way. Psi of x and t is psi of x times e to the minus i e t over h bar. But the probability density, which is psi star psi, turns out to be independent of time. Because if I take the complex conjugate of this function, I get psi star e to the plus i e t over h bar. Then I have psi e to the minus i e t over h bar. These two exponents cancel because they're complex conjugates of each other. And so this just gives me psi star psi is equal to modulus square root of psi x. Now the expectation values are also independent of time for the same reason. I have expectation value of q is just the complex conjugate of the wave function, which again is uh, psi star e to the plus i e t over h bar. I put my operator in the middle, q. I apply it to the right side, psi e to the minus i e t over h bar, integrate over dx in all space. Again, if this is a function of x and p, then it's not a function of time. And that means if it's time dependent, I can pull the time dependent parts out of the integral completely. Uh, and, I, and they cancel. And so I get that this is simply the integral of psi star q psi dx. So now let's look at the, uh, at the spatial function. Now the spatial function starts out like this. It's 1 over psi minus 1 over psi minus times h bar squared over 2m d squared psi dx squared plus v is equal to my separation constant e. Again, I'm going to manipulate this a little bit and uh, I get minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi dx squared plus v psi is equal to e psi. So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation. We'll see this a lot. Now notice this is a constant energy. And so this is clearly corresponding to a system in classical mechanics where this is the kinetic energy, this is the potential energy, and this is the total energy. And there's an operator for that. It's called the Hamiltonian. In classical physics, it's p squared over 2m plus v of x. For the same reason, in quantum mechanics, we call this operator the Hamiltonian when we apply it to psi. And so the Hamiltonian operator is minus h bar squared over 2m d squared by dx squared plus v of x. Now remember, this is basically, if you take minus h bar squared d squared by dx squared, that's momentum squared operator. And so this is, this is perfectly uh, analogous to the classical uh, solution or operator. Therefore, the time independent Schrodinger equation can simply be written as the Hamiltonian operator applied to psi is equal to the energy applied to psi times psi. Well, the solutions to this Schrodinger equation are called stationary states, and they have constant energy E. Now, there can be lots of such states, and we'll see those in a minute. But each state will have its own energy. The expectation value of the energy is therefore just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So that's the integral of psi r h psi dx. Remember, this is all time independent. Well, when you apply h to psi, our Schrodinger equation tells us you get an e. So I get e times psi, but e is a constant, I can pull it up. So that becomes e times the integral of psi star psi dx. If the wave function is normalized, this just equals to 1, and I have the total as being equal to the energy. The variance of the Hamiltonian operator is psi, uh, sigma squared, sigma sub h squared, is the expectation value of h squared minus the expectation value of h quantity squared. Again, this just gives me e. If I put an h squared in here, I apply it twice, I'll get an e squared. They're both constants, they pull out. I then have e squared minus e squared, which is exactly zero. So the variance is zero. Uh, 
And this is what the fundamental property, one of the fundamental properties of the stationary state is that its energy is a single value constant and its variance, the variance of the Hamiltonian for that state is zero. So if we want to construct a full time dependent solution, uh, we have to start with each spatial solution, each stationary state of a particular Hamiltonian will have a specific energy. And there's an infinite number of these kinds of states. Psi 1 has the spatial part psi, uh, lowercase psi 1 of x times e to the minus i e1 t over h bar. Similarly with psi 2, you have e2 and psi 2. And then all the way to the nth value, which then goes on to infinity, capital psi n of x and t is equal to psi n of x minus e to the i e sub n t over h bar. If I want to make a general solution out of these uh, stationary states that solve the Schrodinger equation, this particular potential and Hamiltonian, then I can just make a, a linear superposition of these. And so a full time dependent solution is obtained by linear combination of the time independent wave functions and each of them has their time dependence as well. And so I can write my general psi of x and t is equal to sum over n from n equals 1 to infinity, c sub n, which is just a constant, psi sub n, which is the nth uh, stationary state, and then the time dependence times the time dependence of that nth stationary state, e to the minus i e sub n t over h bar. Now, each of these energies is different. And so this state will not have a variance in the Hamiltonian, will have a variance in the Hamiltonian. So this general solution doesn't have a time independent expectation value because the time dependence is, is in here and it can't be pulled out because uh, each of these terms is different. Each of them has a slightly different time dependence because it depends on the energy. Not only that, but it does not have a zero variance for the expectation value of the energy. So um, in general, we leave the time dependent portion implicitly as part of the solution. So we don't show it. We'll really only talk about when we're talking about time independent uh, quantum mechanics, we'll talk about the stationary states. If we then need to get a time dependence, we can put the time dependence back in, understanding that it's always there implicitly and it depends on the energy of the stationary state. And it's an exponential that looks like e to the minus i e sub n t over h bar. Finally, um, I want to talk about uh, the Dirac Brockett notation. And the reason I want to talk about this is it'll simplify us writing everything on the, on the slides. And it's a much more compact notation than showing integrals all the time. So Paul Dirac, uh, in developed this formalism for quantum mechanics, which we use commonly. You'll see it a lot. Um, we're going to look at this more in detail in chapter three, because there's a whole underpinning of this formalism. But one of this formalism, one part of the formalism is a compact notation, which is the Brockett notation. And I'm going to use that starting immediately. So up to now, we've looked at the integral form of, of things, and we have a Brockett form. So the ket is the wave function, psi of x. Again, this is all spatial, uh, spatial functions only, time independent. And the, the ket is denoted the following way. You have a, a vertical bar, psi, and then an angle bracket to the right. Psi star is called a bra in this notation, and it has a left angle bracket, psi, and a bar again. And note that there's no complex conjugate here because the complex conjugate is implicit. When you have a left facing uh, angle bracket, there's a complex conjugate in there. So this is really meaning psi star. Normalization can now be written in a very compact form. Normally we would write it as the integral of psi star of x, psi of x dx is equal to one. Well, when we put a bra and a ket together like this with the vertical bar in between them, then this implies an integral. And so this bra ket uh, notation is equal to one, means that this is 
the normalization integral. It's a normalization condition. Similarly, expectation values are written the same way. For the integral form, you have psi star q psi dx. And then in the bracket notation, you have psi as a bra. And then you have q inside the ket to the left of psi. And what this means is that the operator is applied to the right. It's always applied to the right. And this explicitly shows how it is applied to the right. Sometimes you'll see it written as uh, a, a bra and then, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, yeah, bra and a vertical bar on both sides with the operator in the middle and then the ket on the right side. It's the same thing. Whether you have a bar here or not, Q is always applied to the right. So with this notation and these formalisms, we're going to be able to write things a lot more simply in the future. And I'll start using that right away.